Hey there, my name is Dakanta and I ducking love science. Today we're going to be talking about some home water testing and by the end of this video hopefully you should be able to also test your home water quality and see if you have any contaminants in your water as well. So timeline for today, what we're talking about, first a little bit of background information because as a scientist, if you're ever gonna do an experiment, you've gotta do the homework first. You gotta look back and see what you're dealing with. So a little bit of background data here for uh, Portsmouth where my home is located currently and my prediction of what I think we're going to find in my home water and just some things to keep in mind. Then we're gonna move on to the actual water tests. So we're gonna explain why they're important, what we're doing, how we're testing it, what the results mean, and then a little bit of a golden nugget here, how to graph that data on Google Maps, which I don't know if you knew how to do that, but it's a thing. I know it's pretty cool. Google Maps is the almighty powerful one, right? So uh, background information. My husband is in the Navy, so we just moved to Portsmouth, Virginia from Arizona actually about a month ago. Uh, it's really important wherever you're going to, new home, new location, to figure out what the water qual quality is like in that place, in that, in that place you're living. Before you ever put a chemical in your body, you should always know what's in that chemical and water being one of them no different than the water that comes out of your sink at home or from your bathtub or you know you're from your fridge you got to know what you're putting in your body so some background information here since we just moved to portsmouth virginia full disclosure i haven't drunk a drop of water from my sink since we got here i've been living off of costco and sam's club bottled water just because I want to practice what I preach and I've always told my students you know you've got to know what you're ingesting before you ingest it right especially if it's a chemical which everything essentially is everything's chemistry so I have been living on bottled water until I could make this video with you guys and figure out what's in my water before I drink it so a little bit of background information on Portsmouth here in the area According to the Portsmouth government website, they have a test from 2018, so just this past year, that yielded the results where they felt like the water in Portsmouth was most susceptible to agricultural, urban, and forestry runoff. So they were kind of assuming that if there's any kind of contaminants, it would be due to those factors there. And if you're curious or interested, the link is there. You can find pretty much any information you want on the area you live in by going to a .gov website for your state and looking up the water quality control or water testing. Every state pretty much has one, so I encourage you to check it out. Also, it kind of depends on how old your house is. The house we're currently renting in Portsmouth was built in 1984, so it's kind of an older home. It's not your newest model on the block. Uh, granted, though, there are homes from the 1800s here, so a little different than what I'm used to in Arizona for sure. Uh, but 1984 is the home we're living in, and according to the Virginia Department of Health, pretty much any home older than 1986 has a higher risk of having lead piping or plumbing, uh, fixtures and solder, and so our house has a slightly higher risk of having these things in place, which could contaminate our home water as well. It's also important to know where the water is coming from. So. In Portsmouth, the water comes from four surface lakes. The first lake is Lake Mead, which is farther up north in Pennsylvania, so that's a ways away. But the other three lakes, we've got uh, Cahoon, Spites, I don't know if I'm saying that right, and Lake Kilby, forgive me, fellow Portsmouthians. Um, but you can see that those are actually not too far away from our house. Our house is the one that is circled in black right there. Right there, I circled it. Um, so the other three lakes are not too far away from where we live, and Lake Mead, again, being farther up north in Pennsylvania, that's still quite a ways away. And then we also have five deep wells, according to the government website, that we get our water from. Uh, however, I don't know where those wells are. They didn't disclose that, just that there are five of them. So the water coming to our homes, coming from those four lakes and from those five deep wells, and from that, we have gathered a bunch of data, or the city of Portsmouth has gathered all of this data. You can see that they're testing maximum levels of contaminants. Uh, that's what the MCL stands for, if you're looking at the column headers there. So like, what does the EPA allow us to have in the water? 
So it's important to remember that we have things in our water, additives, you know, to control bacterial growth, algal blooms, anything like that, that we can limit the contamination. So we do add things to our water and that's okay. There has to be a limit though. So what we're looking at here is a maximum contamination limit. What does the EPA, i.e. the Environmental Protection Agency, allow us to have? What is the range of acceptable chemical levels we can have in our drinking water, in our home water? So that's kind of our MCL there. The MCLG is the maximum contaminant level goal. So if you look at these, uh, these last two columns right there, right there, there we go, for a copper and lead, you can see that there's an MCLG of zero for lead. Well, yeah, we would hope there to be zero lead in our water. That's kind of the goal, right? The overarching, like, yes, let's make sure that there's absolutely none as the goal. But realistically speaking here, they're saying, hey, we have an action level, an AL of 15 for lead. So I don't know if you can see that that's right here. I'll show you on the mouse there. So we can have an action level of 15, which basically means, hey, if it gets to 15 PPB, we're gonna talk about that in a second. Hold, hold on to your horses there for that one. But if we have an action level of 15 PPB, that means we need to take action like now, like stat, like yesterday. Something is really, really wrong, right? So goal zero, 15, we need to take action now. Let's take a look here at some of the other data that uh, Portsmouth has collected. You can see sulfates, pH up here. We see some pH in units. We're going to talk about all these, what they mean, why it's important to know these, the alkalinity, the hardness. Uh, we're not going to talk about conductivity in a lot of these guys. It's a very standard in-home test, so we don't really have all of the capabilities that the city of Portsmouth does, but we'll get the basic idea. We'll get the general picture. What I'd like you to notice here, though, is that nowhere in the data that I have found in their published data do they mention testing for nitrates or nitrites, which are some factors that come from the nitrogen cycle. Uh, these can have some negative health effects, uh, especially on babies. So kind of important if you have a baby in the home or if you're planning on having a baby in the home. Um, I haven't seen any data for that here, but we are going to be testing for that in my home water today. My prediction, therefore, is, again, scientists here, you've got to come up with a prediction, what you think is going to happen. So my prediction here would be that, okay, Portsmouth doesn't look like they tested for any nitrates or nitrites in their water. And nitrates and nitrites come from the nitrogen cycle, which is from soil. Soil is typically used with agricultural processes. They also mentioned in their article that we are most susceptible to agricultural and forestry runoff in our water as contaminants. Therefore, I hypothesize out of all of the uh, chemical tests we'll be doing today, that the nitrates and nitrites will be the highest level of contaminants. Hopefully they will still be within the EPA guidelines of safe, but we'll find out. I hypothesize they'll be the highest. The other hypothesis that I've kind of uh, thrown together here is that I know our home is older. We do have a higher risk of having lead in our water due to older piping and plumbing and faucets and all that jazz. But because Portsmouth treats their water with an anti-corrosive agent, I hypothesize that since they are treating it, unlike Flint, Michigan did, this is the reason why Flint, Michigan had that crisis, because they did not treat the water in an effort to save money, right? So we know that Portsmouth is treating their water correctly. And so therefore I hypothesize that there shouldn't be any lead in the water, <laughs> keep our fingers crossed on that one, and that all of the other chemical tests will yield a normal within the EPA guidelines standard. At least that's what we're hoping for, right? So some things to keep in mind here. You can only measure or you can only do a lab based off of the accuracy of the instruments you're provided. In this case, we are given qualitative data. So it's not the best. It's not like we're given numbers or a value on a pH machine or anything like that. We're given basically strips of paper that change color when they come into contact with other chemicals. So if there's copper present kind of thing, it will change to a certain color to indicate that there's copper present. Very similar to a pregnancy test. 
either you're pregnant or you're not and you get a line or you don't. It's, it's kind of the same thing. So really we're basing our interpretation of these results off of my eyes, which you can clearly tell are not the best since I'm wearing these lovely little glasses, um, based off of my eyes ability to distinguish the color difference and associate a number to it. So, nah, nah, just keep that in mind. My test kit, if you're interested, I ordered it on Amazon. Here she is right there, drinking water test kit. All fancy, all fancy, look at that. They're making a killing on this, by the way, for the little strips they've got in here. But we'll see how, how good it is, right? Um, we've got a lead test in here. That's our lead test packet, what we're gonna try. We've got our four in one water check for our alkalinity, pH, and uh, hardness, and chlorine. And we've also got our copper check here. We have, last but not least, the nitrate, nitrite test that I was telling you about. And a completely different test for bacteria. This one takes 48 hours, so I'm gonna need to kind of snip in that video later. This one's gonna take a little bit longer, but we're gonna put that one on the side for now. All right, the other thing, I was talking about that PPM stuff or PPB. Parts per million is what that stands for. We use that as a way of expressing very, 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 very tiny, tiny amounts in the solution. So if we're thinking about chemicals, how much chemical is in a certain amount of water, we want to give that a value of parts per million. In other words, if there's one part per million, there would be one part chemical per million parts water, for example. So we can also use the unit of one milligram of stuff of whatever the chemical is or contaminant or whatever it is we're looking at per liter of water. So milligram over liter is the same thing as parts per million. They are interchangeable. So if you see either or, it's kind of the same thing. Another thing to keep in mind is that, okay guys, there's gonna be stuff in your water. It's just how much stuff is in your water. Okay, it's not necessarily a bad thing that there are things in your water, other chemicals in your water. It just depends how much. If it's elevated, if it's above the EPA standards and guidelines, then it's possible that it would be a pollutant or toxic to you at that point. Below those levels, you're perfectly safe. Everything's okay. So no reason to freak out if there is a positive result, which there will be for a lot. Of them. Okay. So this first test, which I promised you we're gonna kinda like snip in later, uh, this is for bacteria check. We're looking for total coliforms. That's this guy right here. And so when we're looking for bacteria, uh, just recall that bacteria are little microscopic organisms. You can't see them with the naked eye. You need a microscope, high-powered one at that. Um, and they're everywhere. Uh, we are made up of, of bacteria. Pretty much our whole gut system is made up of bacteria. In fact, we couldn't live without them. Uh, there's actually a great little NPR segment where, where they pose the question, if aliens were to come down to Earth and study us, they would probably classify us as bacteria because we have so many more bacterial cells in our body than we do human cells. Just let that sink in for a second. So being that there's bacteria that's predominantly you, it's not a bad thing if bacteria is in your water. The problem is, is that their presence could also indicate the presence of pathogenic organisms or disease causing organism, organisms in your water. So the EPA max level here, what they're saying is like, this is what's acceptable, is negative. It should come back negative. Like there shouldn't be any coliform bacteria in your water, any total coliform bacteria, right? Which again, the total coliform is like normal bacteria. This is a huge subgroup, as you can see in my image over here. Total coliform kind of encompasses the whole group there. Uh, fecal coliform, that's poo. That's what's in your poo, right? Um, and E. coli, and then the stuff that causes nasty, nasty diseases and things like that, ickiness, throwing up and visit to the hospital, intestinal illness, right, in this case. So again, we'll come back to that another time. We're going to move on now to pH 
pH. That is what I refer to as the power of hydrogen. And hydrogen are these little tiny ions that are floating around in the water. Uh, water is actually made up of H2O. So there's two hydrogens, one oxygen kind of bound up together. And they kind of go back and forth in this equilibrium of becoming H ions, so hydrogen, and OH ions. Uh, when those two come together, then you have an HOH, -H, hence H2O, water. So when we're measuring acidity, we want to see, well, how many of these free little H guys are floating around in there? If you have more H guys that are free, so to speak, floating around in the water, then you have a higher acidity or a lower numerical value in the acidic chart. So think like lemon juice, really sour, right? Or battery acid, please don't try battery acid. Um, but battery acid would hypothetically also taste sour here because it has a very acidic pH. Anything that's acidic tends to be sour. Um, Alkali is another word for basic. So hashtag basic, right? <laughs> no, so uh, alkali would be like your bleaches, your soaps, your cleaners, ammonia, things like that. Those are all basic chemicals. Neutral is what we're kind of shooting for here. We want the Goldilocks zone. So the EPA maximum level there is gonna be a pH between 6.5 and 8.5. So if you can look on this chart here, that would be like from here to there. We're like right in that neutral zone. That's a safe level. If our water comes back as too acidic, so over on this side of the chart, then what we end up seeing is that the pipes corrode that brings the water to our home. And once pipes corrode, that's when we get heavy, heavy metal, well, excuse me, blah, 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 heavy metal leaching into our water sources. That's the problem. So not necessarily that your water is the same acidity as soda. I mean, we drink soda all the time, right? or coffee or you know anything like that. The problem is that it causes corrosion and that's that's the danger of bringing acidic water into your home. Total alkalinity kind of ties together with pH in in this sense, but it's not exactly the same thing. Alkalinity, you'll notice, is very similar to the word alkali. So alkalinity for water is the ability of water to basically resist a change in pH. It's like, it doesn't want to change, it wants to be neutral, it wants to be that way, and nothing's gonna make it move kind of thing. So it's, it's if you started dumping in battery acid into the water, maybe not that extreme, but if you ended up dumping something acidic from this side into the water, would it not change the overall pH of the container of the water? So if you had a container of water at eight, pH, let's say, and you could add acid, add acid, add acid, which should make it more acidic, but it doesn't. Then you have water that has high alkalinity. The maximum EPA level here that we're talking about is between 75 to 150 parts per million. Again, remember we can interchange that with our milligrams per liter as before. Those are the same units, same idea, okay? Now, if alkalinity is low, if alkalinity is really low, then it's associated with that acidic pH and for the same reason can cause corrosion to your pipes and bring in heavy metal leaching into your water source that you're drinking. Alrighty, next test. Next test is going to be the total chlorine. By the way, this is all done with this four in one checker right here. So we're just gonna go through all four of those before I do it, all right? So this will be number three out of the four, the total, total residual chlorine test. So if you look at this little diagram I've got over here, we can see that total chlorine is actually an additive. So we put chlorine in the water to treat for things. We want to disinfect it. That's pretty much the reason why every jacuzzi you've ever been in or public swimming pool is doused with the stuff and you come out smelling like a chlorine vat. They're trying to prevent any kind of bacterial contaminants, fecal contaminants, anything like that. They're trying to bind it up with the chlorine that they add to the water. So what we do is we'll add a certain amount and then that chlorine is gonna combine with stuff that's in the water. It can combine with organic and inorganic materials, meaning bacteria, right, organic, things that are alive, and inorganic, like metals. It can bind to stuff that's in there and kind of bind it up so it can't hurt you. But what we also see then is, hey, 
if we have leftover, let's say we added a whole bunch, we added a whole bunch and that combined with some chlorine, and then we have some free chlorine left over. That is kind of there and available for disinfection. So if there's extra bacteria that happen to come into the water at some point going from the treatment plant to your home, then the free chlorine is there to kind of like take on the battlefront because the other chlorine's already bound up, kind of fighting its own battle. So in sum here, our total chlorine is just the sum of our, of our combined chlorine and our free chlorine over here. I'm getting used to this whole thing. It's all backwards. It's weird. All right. So the EPA maximum level here, what we're looking at is four parts per million for total residual chlorine. So how much of that total chlorine do we got? four parts per million. If there's too much more than that, what we see is that it can cause stomach discomfort in, in, in humans. So we want to make sure that we can kind of limit that. I don't know about you. I don't like a, you know, a sore tummy, not really the best thing. All right. Last but not least for our four in one water checker, total water hardness. Uh, water hardness is attributed to different uh, ions that are in the water, different metals, mostly calcium and magnesium are the culprits. Haven't really seen so much of this here in Portsmouth, Virginia, yet. <laughs> We've only been here for a month, remember? <laughs> but in Arizona, this is a big problem. Arizona's water is notoriously hard. We have like the hardest water in the country, I think. Uh, so the EPA maximum level is 10 to 100 parts per million. It's a pretty wide range. And um, really, this doesn't do a lot of damage to us necessarily, because I mean, it's like adding ions, right? It's just it's it's electrolytes, if you will. So if you've if you've ever heard a commercial for Gatorade, right? They add electrolytes, so let's water all our plants with Gatorade because it has electrolytes. They like them, right? So these are essentially a lot of electrolytes in our water. So not really so bad for us, but really bad for our faucets. And if you're a little bit OCD and you like everything clean or you like to, you know, make sure that there's no scale on your water, like I do, and scrape it off with a razor blade, right? Uh, then it can, it's, it's, it's a severe problem. It'll, it'll clog up your faucets. It'll get into your water heaters, make your water heater explode after a while because, you know, it's all building up on the inside of it. So more or less a property damage issue here for um, that buildup of mineral scale for water hardness. Uh, just as a general idea here, here's some lists of the different ranges. Um, we're looking at soft water. I'm sure you've heard that term. It just means that there's less calcium and magnesium in the water. So if it's soft, it doesn't have as many of those minerals in it. Not as many of those metals are floating around in there. So zero to 60 parts per million, or again, that milligram per liter, those are interchangeable. Please make sure you've got that clear in your mind. Um, Moderately hard would be 61 to 120 or 121 to 180 for hard water, probably all of Arizona, right? Uh, 180 milligrams per liter would be very, very hard. And of course, that would be way outside the EPA guidelines of what they suggest as a maximum level. Um, in order to deal with hard water, you do need more soap, more laundry detergent. You probably need a water softener and all those kind of things. So again, more of a nuisance to have that hard water there. Okay. There, yep, there's, there's the picture right there up there. So that's what you got to fight with if you've got a lot of hard water in your home. <clears throat> Alrighty, so let's do this. Let's try this four in one test that I've been dying to try. Do, do, do. Alrighty. So we're gonna follow this little instruction manual that it came with here, which is the same picture. This image right here is uploaded right th wrong way, this way. Uploaded there for you. That's where I put it. Um, as you can tell, my green screen doesn't want to show you all the green colors on there. So we're going to try and work with this one up here, the picture I've uploaded. Ah, the test procedure says to dip one strip into 250 milliliters of water and gently swirl the strip for five seconds. So, I'm just gonna violently rip open this uh, this packaging here. All righty. All right, so here's our little strip. Here's a little doodad right there. Um, 
and this strip you can tell is four and one. So everything we just talked about, that pH, the total alkalinity, what we're dealing with there, uh, the total chlorine is our third one, and the total hardness is our last one. It also says, hey, with 250 milliliters, well, by Jove, would you look at this? I've got a beaker of 250 milliliters of my sink water. Oh. All right, so we're going to take this 250 milliliters. By the way, if you're doing this at home, you don't need a fancy beaker to do this, okay? I'm just, I had some, and so don't, don't, even, don't go out to Amazon and buy beakers unless you want them because they're freaking cool. But you can just, you can go into your kitchen and grab one of these things right here. They got 250 milliliters on there just the same. Remember, these are qualitative. It's by the color that I'm determining. You don't need like some fancy smancy kind of glassware or anything to do it. All right, let's get back to business here. We got our 250 milliliter beaker. It says that we're going to gently swirl the strip for five seconds, and then we're going to remove and shake the strip once, only once, and uh, then we're going to wait 20 seconds and match it with the color chart. Okay, all right. And I have to complete the color matching within 10 seconds. Oh boy, this is gonna be a challenge. All right, so we've got, are you ready? Everybody count with me, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, all right. so. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, and shake once, shook once, perfect. And now I have 10 seconds to read what the colors are looking like. I'm gonna show you guys here. That's kind of hard to see, yike. All right, well, to me, it looks like the pH is around 6.5, I'm just gonna drop that down on my piece of paper over here, off screen. It looks to me like the alkalinity is 240. Okay. The chlorine looks to be 0.2. And the total hardness looks to me to be about 50. That's what I'm gonna guess there, 50. Okay, that's a shame that it doesn't wanna show you guys the green, huh? Let's try this. Can you see that now? Well, still not so much. Oh well, bugger, okay. Alrighty, that's what I've got there. So. We're gonna input that data into an Excel spreadsheet so we can figure out what to do with that later when we're graphing it on Google Maps. But for now, let's move on to those other nifty tests here that we've got going on in our cool water kit. The next one is the copper test. This is a heavy metal, so it's found everywhere, right? We use it in our electrical wiring. We use it for so many things. Copper is very, very useful. It coats the outside of pennies. Used to be more of pennies, but Believe me, it's hardly any bit of pennies. It's just like dipped on the outside of pennies nowadays. Um, but also found in rock, soil, water, sediment, and that's how it ends up in our water source. So the EPA says, hey, it's cool if you've got within no more than 1.3 parts per million. So if you've got 1.3 parts copper per million parts water, you're good. As long as it's less than that, you're fine, right? Or in this case, we could also use PPB. That would be 1,300 parts per billion parts of water, okay? So if we have more than that, what we can see is that there's some liver damage or kidney damage that's possible from having higher concentrations of copper in our home water. Uh, individuals with Wilson's or uh, Menck's disease, uh, these are genetic diseases that also result in abnormal copper absorption and metabolism, so their body can't really process it the same way, are at a higher risk to having these kind of copper levels in their home. So if you have a loved one at home with any of these kind of genetic disorders, definitely, definitely test your water with a copper test. So let's check out the copper test, why don't we? Alrighty, so here's my little cool... John's copper test, whoever John is, thank you very much. Thank you kindly, John, for letting us test the copper. And let's see, all right, so for the copper test, we are going to need to dip one strip, hey, I've got one strip, in 250 milliliters of water, and wouldn't you know, I've got another beaker 
notice it's a different beaker because cross-contamination, right? Right? All right, so 250 milliliters of water in here. And in this case, I need to dip it in the water sample for 15 seconds this time with a constant, gentle, right? Back and forth motion, definitely. I plan to do it just like that. You need to remove the strip, shake only once, briskly, to remove the excess water. Right, okay. And then we're gonna wait 30 seconds. So I got a nice little timer on my phone ready to go so we can plug in the 30 seconds, kind of move on while it's reading there. Then we're gonna match it with the color chart below and I'm gonna show that to you, hopefully that shows up. There we go. So we're gonna match it with those little color charts there which you'll hopefully be able to see this time instead of me kind of doing that off screen without you. Alrighty. So first and foremost, open. Ta-da. Alrighty. Opening up this nice little copper test here. John's copper test. Ooh, fancy. Look at that. And that fancy. Fancy little strip there. All right. And here's our water sample. And 15 seconds. Are you ready? One Mississippi, two Mississippi. Three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi, seven Mississippi, eight Mississippi, nine Mississippi, ten Mississippi, eleven Mississippi, twelve Mississippi, thirteen Mississippi, fourteen Mississippi, and fifteen Mississippi. Ta da! All right, now we're going to let it sit and start my timer for exactly 30 seconds. Boom. There we go. It's going. So, We'll wait till that hits 30 seconds and then we'll read that that uh, color there. Figure out what our copper's like in parts per million at my home. Woohoo! In the meantime, let's go to the next slide. We're going to do a nitrate and nitrite test next. Again, these are byproducts of the nitrogen cycle. So we're going to see if we got any problems with that in my home water. Here we are, one second, there we go, 30 seconds is done. Let's compare this guy. So we wanna compare this color pink to one of these color pinks that we've got here. So let me take a look at that really quick. See what it looks like. To me, it's looking an awful lot like 0 0.05, maybe 0 0.01, somewhere between that. Let me show you. That is where I'm kind of thinking it looks like, 0 0.05. The pink color's a little bit off for the camera, but that's what it's closest to. So let's go with uh, 0 0.05 for the copper test. Perfect, perfect. You guys are doing great. Hanging in there. Alrighty. Mm hmm. Okay. So back to this nitrate, nitrite stuff. These are polyatomic ions. Poly meaning many, atomic meaning atoms. There are many atoms that make up one unit. As you can see, there's not just a nitrogen, there's not just an oxygen. Hey, there's a nitrogen with three oxygens attached to it, hence the polyatomic, many atoms connected together there. This is a nitrate and this is a nitrite. You can tell that the only difference between the two is that this one has an extra O, an extra oxygen, and it's positively charged. This one is negatively charged and has a missing O, hence the nitrite. I like to think of it as smaller. Nitrate! And nitrate is like nitrate, ate too much, I don't know, something like that. Okay, so uh, these are found, uh, as I mentioned before, so in fertilizers, animal waste, and through the nitrogen cycle. The EPA says, hey, our max level of this, 10 parts per million for nitrate. It's different for nitrite, only one part per million for nitrite. This is where they're saying, mm -mm, no more than that, right? If you have more than that concentration, what we find is that babies who drink water or formula with water, with these levels, tend to get blue baby syndrome. Uh, they can have illness and then even death if it's not treated or taken care of. In adults, what we see is a shortness of breath. So it's like it takes your breath away, but in a bad way. Um, in this case here. Uh, keep in mind that nitrogen, again, is essential for all living things. Nitrogen makes up the proteins in your body that makes up who you are, essentially every amino acid 
that builds up your proteins is made of nitrogen. So nitrogen is necessary. We need this to live. It's in our poo for heaven's sakes. Like it's a part of us, but we can't have excessive amounts of it. And that's the problem. Anything in excess is bad, right? So we wanna make sure that if you have any uh, pregnant women in a household or any infants in a household, it is especially necessary to test for nitrates and nitrites in your water. So let's go ahead and do that test now as well. We've got all of this one right here. We're gonna cut it in half since there's two of them. Woohoo! All right. And let's read in our little notebook what it says we should do for the nitrate and nitrite test. It says dip one strip in to a 50 milliliter. Oh, does she have 50 milliliters? Yes, she does. I know, it's amazing. It's like I thought about this before. It's crazy. So we've got 50 milliliters of water and we're going to dip this strip in this water for dos seconds, dos segundos. And then we're going to wait a minute after we remove it. And then, uh, let's see, it says wait two minutes if the water's below 55, but hey, I already tested it with my nice little thermometer, which if you have one, great. If you don't, you should probably get one, maybe not one of these, but one of the ones you can stick in like steak or burger meat, right? Make sure that it's fully cooked, that you've killed off all the bacteria in the middle and stuff, that you're not gonna get sick, food poisoning. Very important to have in your kitchen. Anyways, so we're going to wait one minute because the water is actually at 82 degrees right now. So not below 55. And then we're going to match it with the color on the chart again. So the top bar should be for the nitrate. The bottom bar should be for the nitrite when we're looking at those colors. So let's go ahead and do that one now. Here's our lovely strip. It's colorless beforehand. It's got no color to it. We're going to dip this in for how many seconds? Dos segundos is right. Dos segundos. Two seconds. And then we're going to remove it. Wait a minute and compare. You ready? All right. One Mississippi, two Mississippi and done. All right. We've got two seconds. Now we got to let it sit for a minute. Start my timer. There we go. We'll come back to that in a minute. Literally. All right. I know, I know. I, you can't get enough of my jokes, right? Okay. So we'll come back to that. All right. Last but not least, the one I've been dying to try is the lead test. Lead is a heavy metal that can leach into your piping if your plumbing happens to be older, if it's not treated with that anti-corrosive agent that we were talking about that Portsmouth does claim they treat their water with. And um, at, that can leach in if it's a little acidic, right? We also mentioned that. So if your water is a little bit too acidic, that can help the lead or any of the metals leach out of those old pipes and into your water for you to ingest it. No bueno, not very good. Uh, your health is affected pretty negatively with this one. And you can't really have um, more than 0.015 parts per million. So less than a part per million for this to be safe. All right, a minute is up, so let's go back to our lovely little um, nitrate test here. There she is. Let's uh, hold it up against some white paper for you so you can see a little better. There you go. So, not really any pink there, which is a good thing. That is a very, very good thing. Um, let's hold it up to this color scale here for you. So that pretty much means that there are no nitrates or nitrites in my home water, which is really awesome. That's a really, really good thing that there's none in there, especially since that is what I was hypothesizing would be the most. I thought this would be the most. Pleasantly surprised. Pleasantly surprised. This is why we hypothesized beforehand, right? Absolutely. Okay, so zero for nitrite and zero for nitrate. Perfect. Alrighty, back to this lead thing. Back to the lead thing. Alright. So we can't have more than less than one part of lead. 
per million parts of water for the EPA to be consider for it to consider itself safe for this water. Why? Why is lead such a big deal? Well, even in the smallest exposure, lead can have serious neurological effects on developing babies. So any kind of baby that's in utero that's still growing in the womb has some serious damage associated with it, with learning disabilities in their future and in children that are drinking water contaminated with lead. So those poor children from Flint, Michigan, who were drinking this water, being told that it was safe, they probably will have learning disorders for the rest of their life, thanks to that. Uh, and then in adults, we see abdominal pain, weakness, tiredness, cramping, headaches, loss of appetite, memory loss, you name it. Your health is affected in so many ways with even the smallest exposure of lead. So it's a very big deal to make sure we don't have lead in our water. And particularly for pregnant women, uh, again, due to the fact that this would damage a baby's nervous system as it's developing. This can also cause infertility, stillbirths, or miscarriages if an individual or if a family is trying to become pregnant um, in this case as well. So let's go ahead and give our lead test a try. This one's probably a little bit more elaborate than uh, the last one, which is great. All right, so let's read through this. Lead procedure, <clears throat> if I may. Open the foil pouch. <laughs> I thought I wasn't going to get it open for a second. Okay, so I opened the foil pouch. Great. Okay. The test kit contains one lead test strip. Okay. One sample. Oh, look at that. That's the cutest little sample vial I've ever seen. All right. So we've got one of those and we've got one little tiny dropper. Look at that guy. It's so cute. So we've got one little dropper. Uh, let's see, we've got all the things, that's perfect. Using the pipette. Okay, this is a pipette, in case you didn't know. It doesn't go on your nose, it goes for your sample collection here. We're gonna use this one little pipette to add, it says one full pipette to the vial. Adding more water will ruin the test, it says. Okay, so we don't wanna add more water, more than one full pipette. To pick up a sample, tightly squeeze the bulb. This is the bulb on top, so we tightly squeeze the bulb. So we squeeze on top um, and place the open end in the water sample. Okay, all right. So we're going to squeeze the bulb. We're going to put the open end in the water sample. And then I'm going to release the bulb and that should suck up all the water that I need for the test inside my dropper. All right. It says release the bulb to pick it up. Add only one full pipette to the vial. Excellent. We're going to add the one full pipette of water, which is hardly anything, by the way. I don't know if you can really see that, but it's like the smallest little amount right there. Eat me, tiny. All right. And then it says place the test strip into the test vial with arrows pointing down. So here's the test strip. There's the arrow. I don't know if you can really see it. Oh, well, uh, maybe the arrow's right here. It's pointing down, I promise. All right, so we're going to add it, pointing down, and we're gonna wait 10 minutes. So I gotta start my 10 minute timer. Whew, ay ay ay, 10 minutes. You're gonna have to suffer another 10 minutes with me just to find out the details? Oh my gosh. All right, so timer's going. There we go. Well, let wait till we get to 10 minutes to look at that result. And right now I just have it kind of standing right here inside like that. Off to the side there. All right, so that's where it's gonna stand for the next 10 minutes and we're just gonna wait. When we read this, what it wants us to do is look where the strips are coming in. So if there's a strip next to just the number one, we're pretty much in the clear, we're good negative result. That's what we want. Less than 15 parts per billion. Again, remember that is the EPA's max guidelines and also the action level. It's, you know, if it's 15 parts per mil billion or, or more, then, you know, we need to take control of this right now. We need to do something. 
A uh, positive result, on the other hand, would be if we get a line next to the 2, right? So that would be bad. We don't want to see a line next to the 2 at any cost, but that's what we're going to wait to see. Find out if my water's contaminated. Woohoo! Or if I have to keep sticking to bottled water. <laughs> um, all right. So here's a side note while we wait. Did you know that you can graph in Google Maps? Now, Google Maps is pretty much like the way we even drove across the entire country. So it's pretty much like the oh, oh, all overarching, like almighty of the internet, right? But it can also graph data in the maps part. Pretty freaking cool. What's cool about this is that if you decided, hey, I want to do this water test at my house, and maybe you get one of those multi-pack ones, maybe you have your friend down the street do one, maybe a family member in a different neighborhood, or maybe you want to test like the water from the lake in your backyard or the stream, or in my case, we have the Elizabeth River running through our backyard. So I have extra tests. I could go out there and try it and see if that water differs from the one coming to my home, inside my home. Very cool. Then you can plot that data on the map and have all of it there, ready to go, ready to click in real time and kind of play with and see. Uh, you can see on my little example map here, I did that with a group uh, in Tucson when I lived in Tucson, Arizona. And we all kind of did our own data from where we were coming from, where we took the water samples from. You can see that we even color coded it. So we were able to see, hey, if there's a pH difference here or here, if there was a contaminant um, up here by Mount Lemon area versus down here where I was living uh, in my neighborhood. So we could compare in real time if there was a contaminant in our groundwater. So let's say if over here all of these tended to be like a dark green, we could be like, well, what caused that? Was there a groundwater spill? Was there like a contaminant that went into the groundwater system, which there was in Tucson, Arizona. If you didn't know, there was a highly, highly um, bad contaminant, uh, TCE, which got into the uh, groundwater there. And it's something they've been fighting for years and years and years to kind of get it under control. So they can see how the water is moving and what contaminants are in it by graphing on maps just like this. So a very powerful tool. Let's show you how to do that. First and foremost, you're going to want to go into uh, Google and into the map section or just into a normal Google search and just type in your address. So let's go ahead and give that a try over here. Do, do, do. So this is just in my neighborhood around around the corner there. Yeah, you can see I'm there, but this is around the corner. Um, so we've got Reese Drive North. And we're going to say, hey, OK, if that's my address, I want to know what my latitude and longitude is. Now, why do I care about that? If I can figure out my latitude and longitude, then I can figure out on Google Maps where that pin should drop with all the data. So that's what we want to try and get to. So back over on my map, on the pin, I can right click and you see what's here. Boom. And that gives us our latitude and longitude down here at the bottom. So this is the number that I'm wanting to copy and paste over. <clears throat> and that's what I'm going to eventually, I'm going to end up posting that in here in like my whole data section. Once I fill that all in, I'll show you how that works. All right, back to here. Do, do, do. We've got our latitude and longitude. Now we're going to plug that into Google Sheets, just as promised. So we want to, oh, by the way, if you wanted that, the link here, if you're doing this at home, if you're ordering the Amazon, please make sure you order through the link that I'm providing as well through the, for the same water kit. You can add your data. We can all kind of compare on maps. Would be pretty cool. Be like a, you know, worldwide water comparison. Would be awesome. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug in that data that I got there. Do, do, do. Oops. Undo. Uh, notice that, paste values only. Notice that when I plug into Google Sheets, which I don't know if Excel is this touchy, you can do it in Excel just the same, but Google Sheets is super, super touchy about any kind of words being down in the columns, if you're gonna graph or if you're gonna map. So notice I've put all of my parts per million or my milligrams per liter, which again is the same thing as parts per million, up at the top so I don't confuse the system. The only thing I want down here are numbers. Numbers, people, just numbers, if you're going to graph them. If you do um, 
if you do alkalinity, what, what was our alkalinity? Let's see, 240, and then I wrote parts per million next to it, it would not work. It would not work. So we need to make sure we're only putting in our number values. Our pH was 6.5, which is excellent, falls within the EPA guideline standards there. Let's move this over. Boop, boop, boop. We don't want both of them in there and we don't want any commas. All right, perfect. There we go. Our total chlorine was 0 0.2 parts per million or milligrams per liter. Our hardness was 50 milligrams per liter or parts per million. Our copper test was 0 0.05. Our nitrite test was zero, hallelujah. And our nitrate test was also zero. Lead test we are still waiting on. We still got three minutes, three minutes and counting. All right, before we can kind of continue. Let's see. <clears throat> the next thing we're going to do is we're going to open up My Maps, which is here. If you have a Google account, this is the easiest way to get to it, is you just go to My Maps. Do, do, do. You've kind of got like a whole little section here where you can store other previous data that you graphed or that you kept data with. Pretty cool. We're going to walk through how to do this, but let me kind of just show you the steps first. We're going to create a new map within that system. Uh, we're going to, and this will make more sense, I'll walk you through it, I promise. We're going to import the, uh, the data that I've got up here into our map. In the upload tab, we're going to choose that, that specific file that I've got right here to upload. We're going to select latitude and longitude so that it knows where to drop the pin on the map with all of our data connected to it. Then we're going to choose whatever column title we're interested in. So let's say we wanted to compare the lead from my sample to everybody else who would be doing the same thing on the same map. Then, then I could say, okay, lead is my title marker, and that'll be the one thing it compares between all the different stations. Then in order to tell the difference between the stations, we would customize our data by clicking uniform style, and then we can color code it, give it numbers, all that kind of stuff. If you want a, uh, the actual, all the directions kind of all in one format with little picture snippets, uh, this is a great link right here for you if you wanted to download that, feel free to. All right, so let's go into my maps. We're gonna create a new map. We're still waiting about a minute for our test, our little lead test over here. So we're going to, as promised, we're gonna build this map together. So we're going to import. So beneath untitled layer here, we're going to import our data set. Upload, we're gonna try and find a device. Look, there's my hubby, isn't he cute? Um, all right, we're gonna find, oh, not from my device actually. Let's go to Google Drive, because that is where I want to do, do, do. Find, where's my Twitch stuff? Oh, there we go. All right. We're gonna go in here and I got it in the September folder. So there is the home water test that we're looking for, which of course we're gonna hold on a second because we've gotta wait till we put in this last bit of data, this last little crucial bit of data there before we can plug it in. All right. I've got like 20 more seconds to bore you guys with something. Well, let's see. My first name is actually Lisa. Uh, last name, Daconta, uh, D-A-C-O-N-T-A, but I go by Daconta, lovingly uh, given to me by my students in Arizona, who I miss very, very much. Um, they're, they're wonderful, and they'll always be my kids. Um, I love teaching. It's been my passion since I was little, and I remember coming home from school every day, lining up my stuffed animals and just telling them everything I learned that day like I was the teacher and so here I am living the dream I'm the teacher so I love what I do and I love teaching and I love science so I hope that this is helpful for you too all right we're at the 10 minute mark let's see what this lead test has to say oh boy that's actually not good um, let's see. If you only see one line at the result, 
Oh, that, that might not be so bad. Okay, so let's read. Let's read. Nah, you gotta read first before you panic, right? It's about to panic. All right. So it says a negative result is if the left line, so let's hold this up here. I don't know if you guys can see that all that well. Eh. There. Is that better? Sort of. There we go. Okay. So you can see that we've got a line next to one. We also have a line next to two. But the line is a lot darker next to one than it is next to two. So according to this test, it's saying, hey, if the line next to number one is darker than the right line next to number two, then it's negative. So in this case, the line next to number one is clearly darker than the line next to number two. So we should be good in this regard and having a negative uh, lead test result there. Whew, whew, a little panic there for a second. That, that was scary, all right. Again, qualitative though, this is a qualitative test. So being that a line did still show up from my home water test, I would be inclined to send my water in now as well before I start officially drinking water from my tap, just to be sure. I know it's a little much, but it's always to be better to be safe than sorry, especially in cases of lead contamination. Not so good, not so good. All right, so we're gonna just classify that as a negative test according to what our test kit is from Amazon here. Let's go back to graphing this guy. So, do do do. It's actually, all right, so just a refresh here, import. We're gonna go to my drive, already found my file. Here's my home water test, select. Fetching the document. Notice that this is where I wanna make sure that only latitude and longitude are checked so that Google Maps knows where to plot my little data point. So we're gonna continue. This is the column where we wanna select our marker. Notice that these are all of the titles that I gave my data set over here. So Google Maps so kindly put in all of those titles for us already. Isn't that just super nice? All right. So back here we could say, okay, I want to classify my samples based off of, hmm, what do we have? Our highest number was 240. So let's do alkalinity. There we go. So based off of alkalinity, finish. All righty. Building my map. There we go. So there's my data point. Uh, now, of course, I could have done this with a whole bunch of other people's data points as well in the same sheet and plugged them all in and it would have plotted all these different points all over the map, depending on where you took your water from. I can come over here and I can customize now with my individual styles. So I can select what I would like. I can change it to pH now if I want to and give it a range. I could give it a color range. So I could say, okay, do, do, do. oh, there's not enough distinct values. This is why. So if I wanted to change the colors in the sets, it would be better if I had more data points. But this is how you can do it if you do have more data points. And I highly encourage you to try it. Um, you can see, because I only have one data point, 6.5. But if we go back to my slide over here, we can kind of see that this is many, many different colors. So I have all the different kinds of data plugged in looking at pH or looking at alkalinity or whatever it is. And the cool part about this too <clears throat> is that you can click on that point and have all of the information right at your fingertips. So if you were going to have a bunch of data points all around here, you could just click on your buddy's data point from when they took their data and see what their values came back as. Pretty powerful tool, a very powerful tool actually. All right, so as promised, let's get back to this bacteria check initially. It takes 48 hours in order for this to kind of set and show us the color if there is any bacteria present. So just as a reminder from the beginning of the video, what we're looking for is uh, total coliforms. We're looking for that big group there. EPA maximum level is negative result. So we're going to see what this Amazon test kit, home water kit has to say about the bacteria in my home water. 
Let's see. So it says I need to wash my hands thoroughly with soap and water, which I just did. Nice and squeaky clean. It says that I need to carefully remove the bottle cap. So, all right, very carefully. And I'm not allowed to touch the inside of the bottle cap. So that's what the powder looks like in there. We're gonna test, use that to see if there's any bacteria. I'm gonna set that down there. It wants me to use my sink water and fill it up to the shoulder of the bottle. So that's what I'm gonna do and hopefully not spill the water all over the laptop. Right to the shoulder. There we go. Looks about right, right to the shoulder. Then it says to securely recap the bottle. All right, done and done. So far, so good. Shake the bottle vigorously for 20 seconds. All right, trusty timer is ready. Shall we begin? 20 seconds. I'm gonna shake it for 20 seconds. And then what it's gonna want me to do is store this in a cool, dry place outside of direct contact with sunlight for the next 48 hours. So what I'm looking for, if there is bacteria in the water, according to this test, it's saying that it's going to change to a different color, which I believe it said the color is yellow. So if it does change yellow, that would indicate that there is bacteria present giving me a positive result, which would be um, not very fabulous, <laughs> actually. But um, right now you can see it's definitely a shade of purple. We've got purple there, let's see, and we're good. Stop. And now we're gonna let this puppy sit for 48 hours. Alrighty. So the next thing that I wanted to talk about is that after I first recorded this video, the initial part, I had a Culligan representative come to my home and test my water professionally. So um, his information is right above my head right there, Mr. Mark Lane. He came out and he brought a really fancy, nice water kit with him that's much, much better than the Amazon kit, obviously. They have more expensive chemicals than I do at my disposal. And uh, so they were testing my water and we kind of wanted to see, well, how good was the Amazon kit then? So. These are the results that we found. We found that for ammonia, we had one part per million, which ammonia, did we even test for ammonia? I don't know, did we? <laughs> Hopefully you remember from the video. Uh, free chlorine, we have free chlorine as opposed to total chlorine, which is what the Amazon test kit did. And we have uh, four parts per million, according to the Culligan water test kit. Uh, also, nitrate nitrite was exactly the same as our Amazon test kit at zero parts per million. And we had a total dissolved solid, that's what TDS stands for, so directly above my head, at 185 parts per million. That means that all little tiny solids dissolved in my water, there was 185 of those. What they are exactly, we're not sure, but there's 185 of them, guys. Yike. I also then had my water professionally tested at a lab. So it cost me an extra $65. The Culligan guy came out, tested my water for free. Thank you, Mr. Mark Lane. But the uh, lead test kit costed an extra $65 and that was performed by this lab here. So it took them about a week. They got the results back to me there and you can see that the result is highlighted. And um, that result, right there, is showing that it's about 0 0.005 milligrams per liter. Again, remember that's parts per million, it's the same kind of thing. So we have about 0 0.005 parts per million or equivalent to about five parts per billion. Um, you can see that the bottle all the way over here, right there, that is the special lead bottle. Notice it's got HNO3 on there, so there's like a preservative in there basically so that he could get it to the lab and have it tested. Uh, this was his test kit that he used, all of his cool fancy uh, equipment and all the stuff that he got to use that we didn't have at our disposal. So this goes to show 
that um, we were correct in having the water analyzed because remember, there was a second line that showed up in the lead results from the Amazon test kit. So albeit very, very small, it still detected that there was some lead present. And that's why I wanted to test it at a professional laboratory. In which case they verified what I assumed in that there would be a very small amount of lead in my water. Now again, they're saying that it's less than that amount, right? So Portsmouth said that their water has about two uh, parts per billion. That's kind of what they claimed in their data analysis from 2018. So it could just be that their, their test ability wasn't sensitive enough to pick up anything less than five parts per billion. So it could be that my water also has two parts per billion, just like the majority of Portsmouth. But granted, any amount of lead is not really a good thing. So I do have some lead in my water, unfortunately. All right, here we are 48 hours later with the bacteria check results. As you can see, the bacteria check is purple in color. I've kept it out of direct sunlight, um, kind of in a dark cabinet of our office space here. So it's definitely purple and purple as described on the bottle is that no harmful bacteria were detected. So that's a good thing. Our bacteria check is then negative. So now that we have all the results in place, let's go through and see all of the results side by side. So we have our Amazon test kit, that's what we did together initially. And as you just saw, the bacteria check was negative, which is perfect. That's within the EPA max level allowed guidelines of also being negative. We found that the pH was 6.5, and that's also within the recommended EPA max level allowed. Uh, you can also see that I've got two extra columns I've added here for the Culligan test results and for the pro professional private lab results. But as you can see, I've added just dashes because we didn't all test the same things. So some things were confirmed, some things were tested that were different, and it's kind of just putting them all together nonetheless to compare. The uh, total alkalinity we see is 240 parts per million according to the Amazon Home Water Kit and the EPA max level is 150. So we've got quite a bit more alkalinity than uh, the EPA is recommending in the water according to the Amazon Kit. And also according to the Amazon Kit, we have 0.2 parts per million of total chlorine where the EPA max level, what we're looking at here is a uh, four parts per million um, however, what we also saw then from the Culligan test results is that the free chlorine was four parts per million. So it certainly seems like, um, to me, that seems like a little bit of a discrepancy between the Amazon test kit and the Culligan tests because total chlorine, I figure, should be more than the free chlorine since the free chlorine and the bound chlorine should be together be the total chlorine amount as as far as I'm understanding it according to the Amazon test kit how it's describing it and the research I've done so if that's the case I kind of feel like that test should be redone again there seems to be a little bit of a confusion there or perhaps I misunderstood what the Culligan guy was saying uh, he did say it was free chlorine but perhaps it was total after all who knows um, Regardless, it doesn't. Either number does not exceed the EPA max guidelines, so we're still good there. Water hardness came out to be 50 parts per million, according to the Amazon test kit. And uh, the max guideline is 10 to 100, so we're right in the middle, pretty much. A little less than the middle, right? We've also got the copper test of 0 0.05 parts per million from the Amazon test, which is far less than the EPA guidelines of 1.3 parts per million. So that's muy bueno there. The uh, nitrate test was uh, zero parts per million, and uh, that's really good. EPA's guideline was 10, so we're at nothing. That's excellent, probably the best result of all. And the nitrite test, you can kind of see I have a slashy mark there because the uh, nitrite and nitrate both together were both zero parts per million, which also the Culligan test results confirmed as well. So he also picked up nothing, which is great. So we did not exceed the 10 parts per million or the one parts per million in terms of nitrite testing. 
For ammonia, the Amazon test kit did not try for ammonia, but the Culligan test results came back as one part per million. Um, as you can see here, there's no EPA max levels uh, for ammonia, but if you're curious about what the ammonia standards are, I've included a link um, here that you can click on and also in the description below. The TDS, if you recall, that's the total dissolved solids. Uh, we did not have a method for testing that with the Amazon kit results, but the Culligan guy had a fancy little machine that he stuck in the water and that resulted with 185 parts per million. Again, there's no EPA max levels on this because it's kind of like this total arbitrary number of literally everything that could be potentially dissolved in the water. Could be the, you know, the salts, the water hardness. Those are all considered like those total dissolved solids, whatever's in there, right? So it's kind of arbitrary. They don't really put an EPA max level on that. However, having 185 seemed pretty high nonetheless. Just say it. And last but not least, the lead test uh, came back as sort of negative with the Amazon test kit. It was because it had two lines still. So it was supposedly like, okay, well, if the line next to number two was darker than the line next to number one, then you had a lead problem. But as long as the line next to number two was lighter than the line next to number one, then it's not so much of a problem. Howbeit, if there were two lines, as I mentioned earlier, that still means that there's a trace of lead somewhere in there because it's picking it up, right? That's why there's a line even showing. And hence, that's the reason why I then sent my water to the professional private lab and had them test it. And they also found that it was a very small amount of lead. Um, now, as stated before, Portsmouth Water does claim to have about two parts per billion in their water source of lead. And the results that the private lab found was that it would be less than five parts per billion for our water. So it could very well be that my home also has two as the same as data for Portsmouth. Um, and that does not exceed the EPA max level allowed of 15 parts per billion. However, I still don't feel entirely comfortable with drinking any water that has lead in it, especially with a baby developing um, currently. Not really a good idea in my opinion. Anyhow, uh, that's the results. I encourage you to go test your own home water, see what yours has got. If you do test it, please write your results in the description below. I'd be really interested to see. Perhaps we could collaborate and make a Google map together and just kind of see how the different water is even across the state or across the country. That would be pretty interesting, I think. Anyways, I hope you love science just a little bit more. I hope you have a great ducking day.